So what happens when these innate abilities <clears throat> that allow us to have reason and logic are used to um, study academically a field that reveals things about humanity in general that explain why we have things like reason and logic and are able to justify the things that we have like psychology and the cognitive sciences um, that are better explanations for why we use and how we use such things than the apologetic that you use. And now this is this is a great point and I'm really glad you brought it up. Um, all academics is all academics any any sort of academic study is um, is needs some form of truth, an absolute standard of truth in order to, to determine whether the results that you have come to are actually real, right? No. Like, for no. example, for example, let me give you an example. Um, you do scientific experiments on, with, uh, with chemicals and stuff like that, you know, in a chemistry lab. Um, now, if you do the same experiment with all of the same everything, it's supposed to produce the same result. If you didn't know that it was going to produce the same result, if you had no reason to believe that, then all sorts of experiments like that wouldn't give you any sort of useful information. Uh, you have no, to. You're dependent on that. The same experiment, in all, with, with all of the same factors, results in the same uh, conclusion. Does that make sense? No, that's not how it works. It's not how it works at all. Do you even science? Yes, I do. Okay, that's not how it works. You're dependent upon the uniformity of nature in order to do science at all. Well, that's a different argument. You change yeah, the you No, that's change exactly it. what I'm saying. No, that's no, not. No. no, that's two different things. Yeah. Dr. Shook, okay. why, why don't you address you what he's just said? And, and, uh, oh, very briefly, yeah. uh, I could say something. I teach philosophy of science. Uh, Colin is not wrong for saying that re we rely on basic... Uh, logical axioms uh, in order to detect contradictions, but those are useful really only for ruling out what must be discarded as false. He earlier gave the example of two experiments that were supposed to be identical, suppose they were, but they gave different results. That rules out some things that we thought we knew, but it doesn't rule in automatically any new information about chemistry or the molecules we were studying. Scientific method is much more complicated than that. There is no such thing as an absolute standard for truth. Strictly speaking, even in deductive logic, you can only repeat truths in the premises and reformat them in different ways in your conclusions. Generally speaking, the rules of rationality are excellent road rules for telling you when you've run off the road, but they don't rule in the truth. Uh, not like that. Science is a lot harder to, uh, to do in order to rule in the best hypotheses. Yeah. It's... So now when you find contradictions in experiments, you, you discover that you are miscalculated something, right? Is that what you're saying? It's something that we thought we knew, but we don't know for sure. That's right. Okay. Okay. So contradictions would not be falsity. valid, right? I'll give you that. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> but not for example, necessarily for truth. For example, a woman could not be both pregnant and not pregnant at the same time, right? And, uh, and a human being could not both be divine and humanly suffer on the cross. Wouldn't you agree, Colin? Uh, yes. Yes and no. <laughs> I knew I was going to hear a contradiction from you. Take that truth, please. Colin. But see, and see, that's a that's a great conversation to have um, between Christians because there are reasons there are reasons that we believe that that is not a contradiction. Can you but tell us your method. The way that you formulated Special the way pleading. that you formulated the question presented it as a contradiction. But here's the problem: you, you see that as a contradiction, so you would say that that, that can't possibly be true. Logic. It, it's in, yeah. it's invalid logically, right? It would appear. Yeah, I would think so. So you believe in the laws of logic? <laughs> uh, there are some things that I believe that I know, yes. Not with absolute certainty. We've discovered that even logic has to sometimes bend in the quantum world. It even has to break, and we need different kinds of logical systems. So I'm still going to be flexible there. But so you think logic so could change? I'm sorry? So you think logic could change? 
logic has certainly changed. It has certainly Absolutely. grown. Any right. historian of logic would tell you that. At which, at which point you in know, time Colin, was the law of non-contradiction not Colin, true? Colin, Colin, <laughs> in, in, in addressing that issue, there was a day when all um, ge uh, geometry was uh, what we now call Euclidean. Because we lived on a flat earth, as it seemed to be, and all the questions we had to ask ourselves concerning geometry uh, were solvable using plane geometry. And then later, as we, as we grow as a species and understand more about the universe we're in, we discover the validity of things like hyperbolic um, geometry and spherical geometry and elliptical geometry. And we discover these other alternative mathematical ge geometric systems uh, that extend it and the rules and axioms and theorems within each of those different methods uh, and, and geometries are similar but very different and you can't mix and match them either. If you, if you want to fly a rocket to the moon uh, or, or calculate what you need to do to intercept an orbit, you know, these, these problems are easiest solved using the proper geometric approach. But these are ways in which we discover that the logic used is really dependent upon the context in which it is being applied. And when it comes down to like quantum mechanics, we discover we're in a very different context and therefore we need a different logic. And so because of this, logic is multifaceted and in many ways depends upon its reliability as it is shown within a particular stable context. So, so yes, I, I didn't really hear an answer to my question. Um, are logical contradictions always, always untrue? Is there is there a point in time or a, a place in the universe in which the law of non-contradiction is not hold? Uh, frequently, in uh, uh, phenomenon of, of of a quantum nature, and also in theology, apparently, uh, theology is perfectly free, like any intellectual discipline, to decide upon the proper scope of application of the law of non-contradiction. It's not a question of whether or not it's a good tool. It's a question of, of whether or not you've got something that that tool really can work upon. Now, there were theologies, Christian theologies, which decided on the basis of basic logic they learned from Aristotle that it cannot be the case that there can be three persons in one when you're talking about the ultimately supreme being for reasons we won't go into. That's history. What I'm interested in is it schismatically divided Christianity for 400 years. The yes. monophysites who denied that Jesus could be truly 100% divine, uh, primarily located uh, down their intellectual center for a time was in Alexandria and Egypt, for example. They were declared as heretics and cast out of the church because they decided that the law of non-contradiction should apply to divinity. They were overruled by democratic votes of councils and frequently by emperors. So these are legitimate theological questions, and I think that you're perfectly uh, uh, at liberty to tell us your theological methods, why you think it might apply or not apply uh, to divinity, and, that, and that's, a, that's a live conversation. I have no problem with that conversation. So it's a question so of what uh, the contradiction uh, should be applied to. So contradictions could be valid. They could be inapplicable, I would say. There might be regions of inquiry where you wouldn't rely on the law of non-contradiction. You'd rely perhaps on other uh, axioms of uh, other logical systems. That's right. If there are certain places, if there are certain instances in which the law of non-contradiction does not hold, how do you know your it God, holds in this conversation we're having right now? Right. Uh, your God would be a shining example of uh, where the law of non-contradiction was suspended uh, back approximately, gosh, 1,300 years ago now. It's okay. In the did, fields, you, did you not understand my question? Uh, are entitled to I'll, their... Let me, uh, let me ask life. my question again. I don't think you're hearing me. I, sa I said if, if there are certain instances in which the law of non-contradiction does not hold, how do you know that it's holding in this conversation right now? I doubt it because you're a participant. You believe in the mystery of three persons in one. You, unless you, unless doubt, you deny that you doubt Jesus was what? divine. Uh, maybe you do. Uh, so, so I'm not understanding I think your okay. answer. You doubt what? That, uh, that uh, the Godhead is three persons in one. I doubt that. If I'm not talking about the Trinity. I asked you, how do you know the law of non-contradiction holds in this conversation? 
because the willing participants are agreeable that it should apply in this uh, field. You may disagree uh, because you have a theology so, that doesn't apply. So, the are, you, so are, you saying, are you saying that just because we've, we've had a consensus that we should use the law of non-contradiction, that, that that's why it holds? It might not. It's right. a question of method, and I agree you are right. You are a participant in a conversation where we do not agree entirely on the method of applying which logical rules uh, should concern divinity. That's exactly okay, right. Okay, so we, do, so we do agree that God exists. Okay. No, I don't, I don't agree that God exists. No. Oh, okay. So you do agree that with that. Oh.